Welcome to Connect at the Capitol. I'm Rosanna Catalano, an attorney, lobbyist, and the owner of a strategic communications firm, Rocket Ship Consultants. I'm the chair of the Florida Bar's Governmental and Public Policy Advocacy Committee. Hello, I'm Natalie Cato, an attorney and lobbyist with Cato Law. We are a boutique uh, campaign finance, election law, and lobbying firm based in Tallahassee. I serve as the chair of the CLE subcommittee for the Florida Bar Governmental and Public Policy Advocacy, Advocacy Committee. Say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> I did not come up with the name of our committee. So <laughs> our committee launched this new show so that Florida attorneys can get continuing legal education credit easily through video streaming. You can watch replays of today's episode by visiting our committee's YouTube channel. Our channel is The Florida Bar GPPAC. That's The Florida Bar GPPAC. Our guest today is State Representative Spencer Roach. Spencer Roach is a retired Coast Guard JAG officer who spent his first 10 years in service as an enlisted man, serving as a search and rescue coxswain. I, did I pronounce that correctly? Coxswain. I'm at, Close enough. Cox, Cox, yeah. Okay, I'm out of my element here. And counter narcotics officer before earning an officer's commission. He attended both Edison Community College and Florida Gulf Coast University while serving on active duty, earning a degree in political science and graduating summa cum laude from FGCU. He is licensed to practice law in both Florida and Texas. He retired from the Coast Guard in 2016 and returned to Lee County, where he has been a resident since his assignment to Coast Guard Station Fort Myers Beach in 2000. During his two decades of service, Spencer's assignments included tours of duty in Alaska, a six-month combat deployment to the Middle East enforcing UN sanctions against Iraq, and service in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina ravaged the Gulf Coast. He was selected for the prestigious Judge Advocate General Program and attended the University of Miami School of Law on a military scholarship. His most recent assignment as a JAG was representing returning soldiers and sailors injured in the line of duty to ensure they received the medical care they deserved. Spencer grew up in a proud blue collar household, working with his father and uncles in a fourth generation family owned plumbing company. From an early age, he gained an appreciation for the trades and an unwavering belief that a superior personal work ethic is the great equalizer in support and pursuit of upward mobility. Spencer was inducted into the FGCU Soaring Eagles Distinguished Alumni Association and was profiled in the National Jurist Magazine in 2009. He has been twice presented with legislative tributes from the Florida House of Representatives in 2004 for his volunteer efforts with Big Brothers Big Sisters in Southwest Florida, and again in 2016 to commemorate his retirement from the Coast Guard. Spencer has always had a passion for public service, and after retiring from the Coast Guard, he served as the District Director for Congressman Francis Rooney, who represents most of Lee and Collier counties. He's a certified ESL teacher and has been active in a variety of volunteer work for over a decade, although his passion is helping children in foster care. While in law school, Spencer managed a program that provided financial literacy classes to children aging out of foster care, and currently he serves as a volunteer guardian ad litem in the 20th Judicial Circuit. He's an avid scuba diver and has traveled extensively all over the world with a focus on Central and South America. Welcome to the show, Rep Roach. Great. Thank you for having me. And thank you for that, uh, that great intro. <laughs> We're so delighted to have you here. So for those who might not be familiar with the Florida House of Representatives and the wide breadth of areas that your office covers, can you give us a description of what your day-to-day -day duties are when you're not in legislative session? Yeah, I, I certainly can. And, um, you know, in this in this process, it's it's a very um, it's a very unique business that we're in. And uh, I, I am certainly still learning. I'm only my third uh, my third year. Of course, we have an eight year term limit here in Florida. And when I got elected, my predecessor in office, Matt Caldwell, told me that serving in the Florida House is like getting a Ph.D. in how Florida works. So I think I'm probably uh, less than a year into that full Ph.D. program. So I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> but um and, you know, uh, Florida, of course, has a part time legislature. We meet in session for 60 days a year consecutively. And in the run up to each session, we have about six committee weeks. Uh, and I think uh, often people assume that as a part time legislature, that's the extent of our work, the 60 days in Tallahassee and the committee weeks leading up to that. But, uh, you know, many times uh, I find myself busier in the district than I am in Tallahassee during that short stint because the constituent services caseload that we manage doesn't go away. 
And, uh, you know, the request uh, locally for updates to the, your chamber of commerce, your local civic organizations, your local political activist clubs, uh, you know, that's really full time. So the big the big joke is that uh, the Florida legislature, it's a full time job with with part time pay. <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> Rep. Birch, could you talk a little bit about what a constituent services caseload um, entails? You know, I, I know that people tend to think of like Congress is doing constituent services, but I think people sometimes forget that state legislators can do that, too. So could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, w- of course, we're in the process of redistricting right now and drawing the lines. And when you when you go back to 2010 and that process concluded, every House rep in Florida had about 153,000 constituents. That's closer to 190,000 constituents now that each member represents. So uh, those members have issues and have needs or have problems. And uh, we, we really are, uh, you know, a one-stop shop for, for constituent issues. So, um, you know, I represent a very unique district. It's one of only two districts in the entire state that's all unincorporated, meaning that I have no cities and in, in, um, in, that I represent, which can be a blessing and, and a curse. <laughs> Uh, so, so really, for for my constituents, I, I'm it for the government. I mean, they have the county commission, of course, uh, but we are often the first call they make when they have any one of a variety of issues, something as mundane as as their trash is not getting picked up on time, or uh, they need a pothole filled. And a lot of that we uh, we push off to the county, uh, but they they're calling us first. And, and anything from a, a problem. A good example is uh, when COVID hit and we had the the DEO uh, website failed and so many issues there with folks trying to get unemployment. I mean, we, we had thousands, if not tens of thousands of constituent services calls to help those folks uh, find a remedy and get the, the unemployment assistance that they so desperately needed during COVID. So uh, we get a lot of a lot of constituent case calls from for DCF related issues. I get a lot of letters uh, as a member of the criminal justice subcommittee from actual uh, incarcerated folks and their family members uh, with, with different issues uh, that they want to talk about regarding uh, their loved ones uh, stay uh, on the state's dime uh, during their time there. Um, it, it, you know, we get a lot of a lot of calls now. In fact, this is probably the number one issue in my county uh, are complaints to the local school board. So those are all things that we deal with. That's just a, a smattering of some of the constituent services issues uh, that we get. But really, uh, any kind of uh, complaint that someone might have uh, will usually end up in our office. And I should mention too that uh, you know I have two staff members that uh, assist me. And uh, really, I feel like I could gainfully employ probably at least six staff members, uh, given both the legislative workload and the constituent services caseload, and then the need to be out and present in the community. I mean, you don't you don't learn about your district and serve your constituents really by sitting behind your desk all the time. You have to be out and you have to be present and meet people where they live. So that's that's a, that's a little bit of what we do in the district. But it, it suffice to say, uh, it is busy both in Tallahassee and when you're back home in the district. Yeah. So speaking of being busy in Tallahassee, can you tell us a little bit about your represent your responsibilities during legislative session? Yeah. And so for, for those who are not familiar with with the process in, in the Florida House of Representatives, you, know, you have 120 members. We have right now uh, 29 different uh, committees and subcommittees that uh, those members will serve on. Uh, and so a member could serve on as little as few as two or three committees. And I think the most uh, amount of committees that I'm aware that a member has is, is seven committees. Uh, and that individual also ha- has, I think, two chairmanships. So uh, I serve on five committees. That's kind of the average number for a member to serve on. I'm currently the uh, vice chair of the criminal justice subcommittee. And so that's how we sort of uh, categorize or partial out or, or silo our workload. Uh, I mean, you, you look at last session, I think there were uh, just north of uh, 3,500 bills filed between the Florida House and the Senate. Uh, about 200 and, and I think 206 of those passed both chambers and went to the governor's desk. I think he vetoed five of them. So, you know, out of 3,500 bills, 200 uh, made it and got signed into law. That's maybe maybe about 10 percent. So uh, it's really impossible for any one member in a part time legislature to know all the nuances of 3,500 bills, many of which are, you know, 60 plus pages long. So uh, we divide the workload into uh, into silos and uh, and ask members to develop an expertise in those committee areas and vet those bills uh, for passage on the House floor. And then and then hopefully they can go on to get on the governor's desk. But that's a little bit about about the um, the structure. And, and I will tell folks that might be watching this that have an interest in politics or in following this. And this is something I continue to learn about. 
Um, I think when I got elected, even though I had some experience working uh, in and around politics um, in a variety of roles, you know, you just have kind of the illusion that if something is good policy, uh, it can make its way to the governor's desk and, and, and get signed into law. And that's really not the case there. There really, I think, are three elements to this job. Um, one, of course, is is the politics. Um, two is the policy. And then, and then three is the process. And if there were a fourth, it would be the personal relationship. So uh, in order to be successful in this process, uh, you have to uh, find a, a good policy. And, and by good, that means something that um, can generate enough support to get through uh, both chambers and all different factions of parties within those two chambers. Uh, and then you have to understand the politics uh, and, and the process uh, by, by which uh, we set up a system of rules and traps for these things to become law. And as, as lawyers, we, we like to focus on process. And I think that's probably a part that most lawyers watching can understand. But the, um, the politics piece, the policy piece, and the relationship piece, uh, it all has to come together to get that product to the governor's desk. And that's, that's quite vexing at times. Well, thanks, Rep. Roach. That makes a lot of sense. And so speaking about the, um, the committee. Sometimes it makes no sense. <laughs> that, as a lobbyist, I can tell you that is true. Sometimes what happens in the process makes no sense. Yeah. Um, so speaking about the committees that you serve on, um, can we sort of talk about those for a few minutes and uh, the types of issues that you handle? Um, you said that you mentioned five. So let's maybe just go through those and you can talk about their various subject areas. Yeah, so my my first um, two sessions, I was kind of healthcare heavy. I was on three different healthcare committees, and I've I've asked to, to switch that out with um, a more sort of education focus. And and I and the speaker of the house, Chris Browse, uh, uh, granted that request. And I, I now serve on two education committees. I serve on the uh, K through 12 Appropriations Committee, uh, chaired by Randy Fine, and the Early Learning Committee, chaired by Vance Lupus. And, and this is the first time in the history of the state of Florida that we've had a committee. Uh, solely focused and dedicated to early learning. So I'm honored to serve on both of those committees. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I serve on the as the vice chair of the criminal justice subcommittee, which incidentally, that subcommittee uh, sees more bills than any other committee in the Florida House. So it's an extremely active uh, committee uh, that vets a lot a lot of bills that are very important. I mean, any, we're talking about uh, you know any any bill which would create new criminal penalties that could result in someone's deprivation or their life, property, or liberties. So that's a very important uh, committee. Um, I serve on the Public Integrity and Elections Committee, uh, chaired by uh, Aaron Grawl. And then I serve on uh, what is my favorite committee. It's the Children, Families, and Seniors uh, Subcommittee, uh, chaired by uh, Representative Thad Altman. And I've requested that uh, subcommittee even before I got elected. And I've, I've, uh, uh, I've been fortunate enough to serve on that committee for, for each one of my, my three sessions, now going into my fourth. But uh, that committee focuses on um, issues surrounding uh, aging and elder care uh, and disadvantaged populations, uh, you know, vulnerable children in the state of Florida, particularly foster care um, and, and DCF related issues. Thank you for that and explaining uh, what some of these committees actually cover. You know, you have a number of bills filed for this upcoming legislative session. Can you tell us a bit more about these bills? And I guess maybe a little bit about the background story to some of these bills. And I can read them out to you. There's a number of them. So I can read them out to you unless you have a list in front of you um, to go over them. Sure. I, I can talk about some of those. But real quick, I think I forgot to mention that I, that I also serve on the Judiciary Committee, which is probably important to any lawyer that's watching this. <laughs> um, that, that is one of the, I, I think, most uh, widely regarded as one of the most influential and prestigious committees in the House. But they have two subcommittees under that, uh, the Criminal Justice Subcommittee, which I mentioned, and then the Civil Justice and Property Rights uh, Subcommittee. So that's also a um, a, a, a heavy uh, committee that deals with a lot of heavy policy that which will affect the work of every licensed attorney in the state of Florida. So that's that's an important one that I wanted to mention as well. Um, uh, Ro, any bills in particular you want to you want to talk about? Uh, one thing. Well, for I say we just go. <laughs> I say we go through them a little bit and okay. and touch on them. I know you've got HB thirty five, which is the partisan elections for members of district school boards. Yeah, this is um. Uh, and so for, for the folks that are watching, you know, each member, uh, according to our House rules of the House, can file seven bills. Uh, it used to be six. That was changed last year by Speaker Sprouls. And in the Senate, uh, they can file an unlimited number of bills. So um, I say that to make the point that we have to be very deliberate and very discerning in vetting 
legislative proposals that we put that we put forward. So you only get seven seven shots at it. And when the session uh, dies at, at the end of the 60 day period, all of the bills die. You don't get to go back to Tallahassee the next year and kind of pick up where you left off. Uh, the, the slate is wiped clean and you start over from scratch. Um, so the, the school board uh, partisan races bill, this is this is a pretty controversial bill. It might be one of the most controversial bills that I'm running uh, this session. Senator Joe Gruders filed a counterpart in the Senate. But as per the Florida Constitution, uh, our school board elections have been a nonpartisan for, I think, uh, uh, probably close to 40 years or, or, or 36 years. And uh, my, my bill, is, if successful, would seek to change that. But this would require a constitutional amendment. Uh, if the bill passes both chambers and is signed into law by the governor, that doesn't mean the Constitution has changed. It simply means that that would go on a ballot uh, in 2020, uh, 2024 uh, or 2022. Uh, and the voters would have the opportunity to, to approve that. And it would require a 60 percent threshold to pass and change the Florida Constitution to make these races partisan. And since you asked me, I want to talk about why this is such a great idea and a great bill. Um, so I mentioned earlier that that school boards and dissatisfaction with school boards is one of the number one issues in um, not just in Lee County, where I live, but all over the state. And I'd say even the nation, when you look at a uh, Glenn Youngkin's victory uh, in Virginia, I mean, Republicans really have a toehold in the education space, which we haven't had in about 30 years since George, George Bush had his No Child Left Behind Act. Um, but so. You know, I, I get some criticism from folks who say, look, the election should be nonpartisan, the school board issue should be nonpartisan. And to some extent, I agree with them. But my my rejoinder to them would be, uh, even if you wanted to vote for a nonpartisan candidate, which we have one serving on our board, uh, you don't know who they are. Uh, so if you truly want to know who is a nonpartisan actor that you can vote for on the school board, uh, you have to allow them to declare their party affiliation on the ballot. So for me, uh, this bill is not designed to help Republicans or help Democrats. It's designed to help voters. And I think in any election, the goal should be to ensure that voters have the maximum amount of information that they can get to make an informed decision. So I think voters have a right to know that. For me, it's a transparency, government in the sunshine, in the sunshine issue. Uh, and if you truly want to vote for nonpartisan candidates, right now you don't have a way to know who they are. So this, this bill would seek to fix that. So if you truly support NPA candidates on the school board, you should also support my bill. So you speaking of transparency, you have another bill, HB 301, about financial disclosures for elected local officers. If you could just let us know what that is and kind of how it came to be. Yeah, this actually is a constituent driven uh, a bill. Uh, this was presented at our delegation meeting by a resident of Sanibel. And um, uh, my uh, one of my state senators, Kathleen Pasadomo, and I were sitting at the, at the table and we looked at each other and said, this is this is a really good idea. And in, in a state that prides itself on uh, government in the sunshine and transparency, uh, there's no reason why local officials should not have to disclose their financial assets. And, uh, you know, members of the Florida legislature, uh, you know, which would include 120 House members and 40 uh, Florida state senators, we've had to disclose our, all, all of our financials uh, going back to 1978. Uh, so we've been doing this for a very long time. The local officials, and these are your mayors and your city council members, they have to file what's called a Form 1. It's It's a very short disclosure, which basically requires them to list uh, um, a, a dollar amount that, that they have. But uh, we've seen a number of high profile uh, public corruption cases in Florida uh, over the last decade involving local officials who are awarding, uh, have, have a tendency to award contracts to businesses that they have an ownership interest in or that their family members are employed in. And the voters have no way of knowing this because they're not required to file a financial disclosure form. So again, I think um, I think a theme that you're seeing from my bill silo this year is is, is transparency and accountability in government. But I, I think, you know, look, what's good for the legislature should be good for these local officials. So uh, to me, uh, I can't think of a single re reason why uh, you wouldn't require them to meet those same disclosure requirements that your elected officials at the state level have to meet, uh, including your cabinet officers and, and the governor. So I, I think that the local elected officials should have to disclose that. Uh, not not that they will have to divest themselves of any interest, but simply so the public can evaluate uh, whether there may be any um, any uh, perception of impropriety in their business dealings. Um, so I, I and again, I just come back to mayors and city council members award uh, around the state billions and billions of dollars in contracts every year. So I, I think that's that's important. And uh, I'm optimistic that that will that that will get through uh, this year and, and hopefully end up on the governor's desk. Your next bill is pretty lengthy. It's HB 679. It's on cannabis regulation. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I filed a very, very controversial bill last year, uh, which proposed to place uh, THC caps into a uh, for medical marijuana program. Uh, and that bill was uh, was pretty controversial. It did make it through uh, two uh, two subcommittees in the Florida House, uh, did not move in the Senate. And I think that was the third year that we have tried, or at least some members have tried to uh, put some caps in place. And, you know, look, I'll be very candid in saying that, uh, you know, if, if Spencer were king, uh, I think that's good policy and I would continue to advocate for it. But, uh, you know, this is the art of the possible, right? And I, I think the political moment, uh, if it existed at all for THC caps has come and gone. And, and I think that as members of the legislature are getting younger and more libertarian, especially on the Republican side, I just don't think that there's an appetite for that. So uh, I've kind of gone back to the drawing board with one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, Andrew Learned, Rep. Andrew Learned. We've put together what is, uh, I believe, a truly genuine bipartisan effort uh, to make some, uh, I think, common sense regulatory changes to Florida's medical marijuana program. And, and these these provisions, I think, are fairly innocuous and they are supported by large segments of the MMJ industry. I mean, these, these can contain... Uh, regulatory um, provisions dealing with with how uh, they advertise the products, uh, avoiding conflicts of interest uh, in the supply chain, and then placing some uh, regulatory framework around uh, Delta-8, which is a hemp derivative, which right now is widely unregulated and available to children. So that's kind of where my focus has been and making sure that these products are safe, accessible, and available to adults that need them and, and keep them out of the hands of children. So I think this bill um, is common sense. I think we can actually move this. Uh, and it also makes me proud to say that, look, it, in Florida, uh, bipartisanship is not dead. And, I, and I'm proud to work with Andrew on this bill. The next bill we see is Foster Youth Internship Program, HB 757. Yeah, this is a this is a bill that actually uh, Senator Albritton uh, has been has been working on. It's really his brainchild and his product. And he's been a great partner in working uh, on some child welfare issues with me. So this bill would, uh, this is a long, really comprehensive bill, would, would, would essentially set up internship programs uh, for children in the foster care system. So uh, I, I will give him all the credit for this and, and I'm proud to work with him on this. And, and again, this is something that I think we can move. And every session that I've been uh, in the Florida House, I've filed at least one uh, child wel welfare bill and I'm filing two uh, this session. Your next bill is school readiness program, mm -hmm. HB 945. School readiness program. Oh, this is the um, yeah. So this is this is a bill that uh, seeks to fund um, what we used to call daycare, and now we call it early learning centers for foster kids. So <clears throat> one of the problems we have in Florida, and I and I should say too for your listeners, I, I am a licensed foster parent. I just had my tenth placement uh, this month, so I'm I'm really uh, involved and active in this community and, and very aware of the challenges that they're facing. But you know, Florida is the only state in the entire nation. That, um, that has a statutory requirement, a mandate that foster parents uh, send their children to a daycare or an ELC, and, and we don't fund it. Uh, we do give them a voucher, but almost 100% of the time, the voucher does not cover the cost. And what we're seeing now with um, an increase in minimum wage and, uh, and this historic 40-year inflationary high, uh, that the cost of child care is skyrocketing. And foster parents are coming out of pocket on the low end, about $200 a month uh, for a single child. And if they have multiple children, as much as $1,500 to $2,000 a month in high cost of living areas like Miami-Dade and Broward counties. And that's that's every year that is listed uh, by foster parents as the number one deterrent uh, for becoming a foster parent or the number one reason why they close their homes and don't accept any future foster kids. So this is wrong. Uh, these children are in state custody. Um, the, uh, the payment for a foster parent is about $11 a day. And then on top of that, to make them pay out of pocket for daycare, which the state is requiring, it's, it's just wrong. And I think we, we can and should do better. And hopefully we will this year. So uh, I've got a great partner in, the, in uh, Senator Aaron Bean there in the Senate. So uh, this, this is my most important uh, bill this session. This is my top priority this session. I didn't know that about the system. So thank you for um, bringing that to light. Now, we have HB 6011, Recovery of Damages and Claims for Medical Negligence. Yeah, this is the bill that I filed last year. Um, it made it through every committee in, in the Florida House uh, unanimously, and it passed off the House floor uh, almost unanimously. I think there were 16, uh, 12 to 16 votes against it. But this is a bill that 
uh, the lawyers uh, watching this, particularly the trial lawyers, uh, will be interested in. But Florida has on the books what has come to be known as Florida's free kill uh, law. Now, that's a, you know, chamber folks would, would say that's a pejorative term. They don't like that. But it makes one come, but it is what, what it is. Uh, in Florida, uh, we, we statutorily prohibit uh, people from filing a non-economic damages claim uh, for the uh, negligent death of a loved one uh, if that person is a is a child. And we are the only state in the nation that has this prohibition, and uh, I'm seeking to change that. So uh, if, if passed, this bill would allow uh, parents to file a claim for non-economic damages for the negligent uh, medical malpractice death of their child. And um, uh, it, it, I, I really am in, in just... <clears throat> incredulous that this law is still on the books. And um, we had great success in the House last year. Uh, we ran into some problems in the Senate. It didn't move. But uh, I, I am more optimistic this year uh, that it will move. I mean, we've had some, a, a change in some leadership on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, uh, which gives me some reason for some more optimism. Again, I don't know for sure if, if it will move or pass, but, uh, but I think the chances are better this year. And if not, uh, I'll bring it back next year. We'll keep working it. So two more bills for you, HB 0057, that's the racial and sexual discrimination. Yeah, I didn't realize that I had filed this many bills already. Um, that, that, <laughs> I was that, like, there are a lot. Bill, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, that bill you just referenced, uh, well, that, that does not sound familiar. What is what is that? You sure that's um, one of my I have bills? it listed. Um, maybe I erroneously uh, I cut and pasted HB 57, racial and sexual discrimination. It would have been filed in, looks like, September. That's, that's not ringing a bell. All right. Oh. <laughs> I might have cut and pasted from the wrong place. It's very possible. So HB 497, Lee County School District, Lee County. Oh, I think you might be reading some of my co-sponsor, um, my co-sponsored bills. Um, I think the bill you just referred to is a local bill filed by, by Representative Persons Mullica, uh, which would seek to make the superintendent in Lee County an elected position rather than an appointed position. So yeah, that's a local bill. That's something we're working on here locally. Um, in Florida, actually, most of the superintendents are elected. Ours is not. We're trying to change that to make that person um, kind of a bulwark against a rogue or renegade school board, and then uh, to have them be more accountable to uh, the parents who are, are paying their salary. So I have to ask, given your other bill, is the intention behind this to have a partisan superintendent? Yes, it would be a partisan race. Absolutely. Yeah. That's interesting. So just to follow up on that, uh, you know, I have a little bit of insider information because you and I are working on a bill together, Representative Roach. Would you give us a little bit of background on that bill, which has not been filed yet, but I think we're hopeful it's going to get filed before the end of the year. I know this is a criminal justice bill sort of in that silo. And so could you talk about that issue a little bit? Yes. Filing is imminent. We are, we are making a couple of uh, last minute tweaks to the bill and, um, this is, this is a great bill, Natalie, and I probably shouldn't have said that the other one was my favorite. This is my favorite also. Um, so, so this bill is going to seek to remove um, some of the um, arbitrary and institutional uh, barriers to employment that our returning citizens, uh, folks who are previously incarcerated, are encountering when they come back into the workforce. So uh, particularly with, with occupational licensing. So, uh, and, and I'll just stress on this bill, you know, right now we have a, a lot of additional licensing requirements and wait times for folks uh, with a criminal record. And we, we want to eliminate that because we feel, or I feel that, that they should be treated the same as any other citizen after they paid their debt to society. And, and, and this segment of the population in particular, uh, we have an interest in getting them back to work. Um, and I, I think it's crazy that we're putting additional obstacles in their way. Um, and especially today, the impetus for this bill, given our labor shortage, our workforce shortage in Florida, I mean, we've got businesses all over the state desperate to hire folks. And, uh, and in many cases, they're prohibited by these wait times or, or other additional licensing restrictions from doing so, from hiring people that have a, a certain skill set uh, in an occupation or in a trade that are ready to get to work. So we want to make that as easy as possible for returning citizens to do. So this bill, among other things, will help to cut some of that red tape out and get these returning citizens uh, back into the workforce and ensure that they are contributing members to society uh, rather than leave them unemployed and idle and uh, and, and could potentially be um, have to resort to other means to uh, to make a living. 
That makes anything, sense. anything you want to add on that, Natalie, about well, about what a great bill this is and why every person <laughs> no, I, watching I mean, this. I, 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 think, I think you really um, sort of encapsulated it. You know, there, there is there's a couple other little technical issues in there about sealing records and things like that. Um, but, you know, overall, we think that this is a really important bill. And you're absolutely right with the workforce challenges and things that we're seeing right now. We, you know, we need to be doing everything we can to put everybody back to work. And that's something that uh, my clients on this issue are very passionate about as well. Um, so just fo following up on this, um, you know, most of your committee assignments sort of focus on these social justice, you know, social issues, children and families, education, criminal justice. But looking forward, you know, um, assuming that you get reelected next year, which I hope that you do, um, what are some of the other issues that you would like to focus on during your time in the legislature? Well, first, uh, you know, let, let me just, uh, you know, give a quick uh, nod to the redistricting process, which we're doing. Um, so, you know, there, there are certainly no guarantees in this process. Um, in order to get reelected, I have to have a lane to run in. Uh, there's no there's no guarantee that that will happen. I hope that it will. But, you know, when, when you when you serve this process, you got to treat every session like it's your last one. So we're going big this session um, and, and every session. But, um, you know, in the event that um, that I have a lane to run in and, and the voters uh, see fit to return me to Tallahassee, you know, I would like to continue to work on uh, certainly foster care issues. There, there are a few bills that I've filed in that arena that have not gotten a hearing. So I'd like to find out you know, how to make them palatable and, and build consensus around that. And, you know, DCF reform is something we talk about all the time. And it's such a leviathan. I really think, uh, you know, we're just going to keep chip, chipping away at that incrementally until we can, um, uh, you know, ensure that the, if Florida's most vulnerable citizens are, are, are taken care of and have the best opportunities for success. But, uh, you know, those are things that interest me. I think it's a historic year with our budget surplus. Um, any any legislator that tells you we don't have money in the budget for that is lying. Uh, we have more money than historically we've ever had in the state in the state coffers. Uh, and I think that's actually a challenge for the legislature. It's, it's more of a challenge than if we had to cut. So uh, finding meaningful ways to allocate that and divvy up that pie is going to be a challenge, especially as we move forward. And if those revenues decline, then we have to go back and, and cut. But you know, one of the things that I ran on, and I talk about frequently, uh, I call myself, look, I'm on the right side of the aisle, I call myself a 10th Amendment conservative, um, meaning that one of the things I like to focus on is what I consider to be the uh, ever encroaching, ever expanding uh, tentacles of the federal government into areas that were traditionally uh, held to be sovereign state, uh, spheres of sovereign state influence. And, and that's something that I think you're seeing Governor DeSantis really, uh, really lead on and really push back on from his plan to um, to, to uh, you know, use the power of the state to address uh, the deportation of illegal aliens that the federal government is resettling here. Uh, I think you're seeing that in, um, you know, his idea about standing up a Florida state guard, which would supplement, not act as an alternative to uh, the, the Florida National Guard. And also with our special session on employer vaccine mandates, that's largely in response to uh, what we perceive to be federal government overreach and telling Florida state businesses what they have to do. So uh, I, I think that, um, you know, in many ways, I'm, I'm proud to uh, support the governor in those initiatives and pushing back against uh, federal government overreach. And I think that's going to be a lasting theme uh, for as long as I'm in the legislature. And as long as states and the federal government exist, that's going to be that tension, that yin and yang is going to be there. So you mentioned um, just now a special session on vaccine mandates. We've actually had two special sessions this year, one on uh, gaming issues and then on the on the vaccines. Could you just talk a little bit about how a special session differs from a regular session and some of the, you know, what happens during the special session process? Yeah, so I, I've only been through two of them and, and both of them were uh, this this last uh, this last summer. Um, so we the governor has the ability to call a special session, which he did twice now. And uh, the thing to know about the special sessions is they're limited in duration. I think each of the ones that we had was for um, a week. And they are limited in, in subject nature. So uh, we have to meet and uh, work on the issue for which the special session is being called. So it's not sort of an open lid to go up there and file bills uh, on any topic that you'd like to. So the first one we had was on the uh, Seminole Gaming Compact, which is still uh, being, I think, heavily litigated. Um, and and that's, that was, a, that was a, an interesting ride for my first special session. Uh, I initially had some concerns about the compact. Um, and then... Uh, at the last minute, literally on the day that the speaker gaveled in the session, he announced an addendum, uh, which would address some of those concerns. I did end up voting for the bill. And then the second special session 
was to address this issue of, of employer vaccine mandates. And I, I think that is a um, is a more interesting look at at how the process works because within the Republican caucus and, and in the House, we're we're two seats away from the supermajority. Um, so so really the Republicans you know control the state legislature in Florida. But within the Republican caucus, there was a split on this issue. Um, you had folks like myself who are more uh, free market oriented and, and happen to believe that um, the less government interference in business, the better. And we want government to stay out, uh, even if it produces a result that we disagree with. And then folks who are more focused on employer protections and using the power of government um, to stop these employer vaccine mandates. So uh, I don't think that we could have passed a blanket prohibition on employer vaccine mandates. And that's that's what failed in Texas, right? Texas, they had three different special sessions and their bill ultimately failed in the Republican controlled the Texas House of Representatives. So we were looking at that very closely. And ultimately, we we came up with a set of incentives and disincentives and like a, a set of traps, if you will, uh, which would not prohibit an employer from putting into place a vaccine mandate, uh, but which would provide some um, incentives for them not to do that and some disincentives if they did do that. And, and that's what we ultimately uh, came up with. I think it was a good uh, compromise product um, that minimizes to the extent we can government involvement and, and allows the free market to work there, too. So um, that's what the governor signed into law. Thank you for that explanation. You know, most of our audience members, as, we, as we've talked about, are lobbyists. What are some of the things that lobbyists can do in the process to help lawmakers like yourself? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. And, and I get, I get to, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, when you look at like poll numbers, the only people that, that poll lower than, than, than congressional people are lobbyists and then maybe below them fundraisers. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot people love to bash lobbyists. And I get this all the time back home. All oh, these lobbyists, you know, but, and I'll, I'll just share my thoughts on lobbyists real quick in general. You know, um, what I tell people, any constituent that calls me and asks me to help their kid get into the school of their choice, ask me about a three way stop sign on, on the road that they live on and their kids play on or ask me to help them uh, resolve a DEO issue. Those folks are lobbying me. Uh, every one of them is, is a lobbyist and is asking me for something. And um, I, I think that when you look at what lobbyists are doing, they're simply uh, businesses banding together to protect themselves uh, from the government. And so when people say we need to get lobbyists out of politics, I say, you know, if you want to get lobbyists out of politics, get government out of business, period. Uh, so that's kind of my position on what lobbyists do. I don't have any animus towards lobbyists and I understand what what they do. Um but if I were to recommend to some lobbyists now that I've had three sessions under my belt, how to be more effective, um, the first is, is to be present. And I think now with the Capitol opening back up, uh, the lobby corps has gotten uh, fairly comfortable and used to working remotely and, uh, and kind of uh, corresponding with legislators via email or text message or meeting uh, virtually. And I, I think that that's effective if everyone's doing it. But when the Capitol's open, open as it is now, the lobbyists who are present and in the Capitol are going to get more results than those folks who continue to work remotely. So if you're lobbying and you want to get to a member, I, I would say be present, be in the Capitol. And then this this may sound silly, but I, I've I've had this happen to me several times where lobbyists will drop off paperwork about an issue that they're working on. And, um, you know, I, I kind of will put it in my stack of stuff until the issue becomes relevant. And then I'm like, oh, well, Natalie dropped off a white paper on occupational licensing reform. Why it's a good idea. Let me pick this up and read it. And I will. And then I'll have a question about it. And finding the contact info for the lobbyists, uh, there's one firm in Tallahassee that, that actually puts their, their number printed on the footer of every single paper that they give you. And that is so convenient uh, because I look down at the paper and I pick up the phone and I call them and say, hey, I'm reading your white paper right now. Tell me about this uh, because I'm going to go vote on this in 30 minutes. Tell me why I should vote up or down on this. And sometimes it happens that quickly. And if I can't find your contact info and I can't call you and ask that question or communicate, uh, I simply might not have the time to try to track you down. So um, I, I, I know that sounds really simple, but it, it that makes a big difference, at least for me. Um, and then I think um, kind of when to engage in, in the depth of the engagement is important, too. Um, you know, one of the things that is so frustrating is, is when you show up at an event with your constituents and you're you're speaking to the Rotary Club, you're speaking to a hostile audience on any number of one issues. You walk into a room, there's 200 people there. You're trying to glad hand as many people as you can that are coming up to talk to you. In your mind, you're kind of thinking about, okay, 
What are the talking points that I'm going to go through? Do I remember them? Does the mic work? Is the podium set up? Can someone get me a glass of water up there that I may need? Where is the bathroom in case I have to get out of there? Um, you're thinking about all these things as you prepare to make your remarks. And someone wants to have a super in-depth, heavy, complex policy discussion with you about the funding mechanisms for local hospitals and their taxing authority. And they want to, they want to monopolize all, all 15 minutes of your time before you go on stage. And, and they're expecting you to, to engage in this heavily complex dialogue while there's 50 people around trying to shake your hand and you're trying to think about what you're going to say next. Um, that, 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 um, that does not help your case. If it's, if it's something that's going to require a complex discussion or you need to educate me on an issue, send me something I can read first. I always appreciate that. Send me something I can read the day or the night before, before you come talk to me. And, and I, I tell every lobbyist this, I'm never going to file a bill on a subject that I simply don't understand. Just like the stock market. I never invest in stocks and I don't understand how they work. Um, so if I don't understand the issue, um, you've got to prep me out first. Last thing I would say, and, and this is, um, I think might come as a, as a surprise and may not apply to a lot of the Tallahassee Lobby Corps, but um, for me and many of my colleagues, you're going to get a much better meeting and a lot more time if you can meet with me in the district than in Tallahassee. And every year we have waves of interest groups uh, from, the, from, this is ironic, they come from the district to Tallahassee to meet with us. So for, uh, you know, uh, 10 months out of the year, you're in the district and they don't meet with you. And then when you're in Tallahassee and your time is, is, is uh, you know, broken down into literally five minute meetings, they want to come meet with you. And that's the first time you're hearing about their issue. Get me in the district where I can give you an hour. I can get out a paper. I can take notes. I can read all of your stuff and highlight it and ask uh, much more uh, probing questions and even start working on some drafts. If I'm going to work on your issue, uh, I think you're going to get a much better meeting with a member in their district than you are in Tallahassee. If, and that may not be possible for all the lobby corps, but um, that's just something I think people should be cognizant of. Those are all excellent recommendations. Absolutely excellent recommendations. Yeah, oh, makes and, and Facebook is the worst way to contact a legislator. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> I mean, I, I certainly hope my lobbying colleagues are not contacting you via Facebook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, since this is a, a Florida Bar Committee, one of the things I was wondering about is how you use your background as an attorney in the legislative process. Do you feel like it gives you an advantage when you're working on legislation or when you're sort of navigating the process? Well, yeah, cer certainly. And, and people often wonder why so many legislators are attorneys. And to me, that's just a natural fit because as an attorney, your, your job as an attorney is to be an advocate for your client, right? And a lot of what you're doing in the legislature is you're, you're an advocate, you're a representative for 190,000 clients, which are your constituents. So I, I think that that, uh, that, that tr legal training you get uh, lends itself perfectly to, to, acting in a representative capacity for someone else. And, you know, not, not to mention the, um, the, the role of statutory interpretation, which is something, you know, look, you don't have to be a lawyer to do that, but, but, but taking classes in law school, which help you to break down and analyze statutes and, and looking at how a court might interpret, you know, whether you use an and or, an or, or where a comma is placed can make the difference on, uh, you know, whether someone goes to jail or not or whether someone has to forfeit their assets or not, um, it, it really makes you write your legislation much more carefully when you understand how a court may or may not interpret it. So uh, I, I think that legal training is certainly helpful. And then the last piece I would say, which is probably the most important, um, in this process, people are very passionate. Uh, right now, our political system is very polarized and, um, and these issues are emotional. And I don't always succeed at this, and I don't know anyone that always succeeds, but I think uh, the legal training you get about how to conduct yourself um, in an adversarial situation uh, with, with an, a, you know, an adversary who is advancing a, a position opposite of yours, uh, that training in, in the legal adversarial system is important uh, to help you uh, remain objective and remain focused and not personalize the issues when you're passionately debating uh, these bills and these legislative priorities with your, with your colleagues. Uh, in the Florida House and Senate. So I, I think that's probably um, one of the more important features you're going to get out of a law school education uh, when you when you go on, if you go on to serve in some kind of elected capacity. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, so just sort of looking backwards for a minute, we went over your sponsored legislation for this upcoming session, but is there a particular bill that stands out to you from your previous 
a couple sessions and what have been some of your favorite issues to work on? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, my favorite issues uh, are, are the child welfare issues because, uh, you know, I, I think you're really having a direct and immediate impact in people's lives and, and in those the lives of those children. So, you know, I worked on a bill, I think it was my first session, um, and the title of the bill was A Year is a Long Time in the Life of the Child. And uh, the governor signed that bill into law, and I think it passed. In fact, I remember it did pass every committee off the House floor and every committee in the Senate and off the Senate floor unanimously. But one of the problems that we've 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 seen in the child welfare system is that you know parents who have their child removed can often linger in the system uh, as as long as nine years, and that child is kind of in limbo. Uh, and and um, I had a constituent case where I had a four year old child that uh, foster parents brought me who had been in thirty different homes uh, in the entire first month that they were in the system. So this little four year old boy had changed homes every single night for his first month in the system. And uh, getting those childs to permanency, whether it's reunification with their parent or, or into adoptive home that's permanent, is of paramount importance. Uh, and so what that bill did was it, it capped the time that a parent has to work their case plan uh, at a year before they had what we call a TPR hearing or a termination of parental rights hearing. Now, I want to just say this to be very clear. It doesn't mean that their, that their parental rights are terminated at, at, at the end of a year. It simply forces the judge to hold a hearing and the judge can, can will make a decision about whether they need more time or not. But what we see so many times is that the parents kind of drag their feet on working the case plan until TPR is imminent. And we wanted to push that clock forward so the parent would know <clears> these <throat> at three months and six months, I've got to get it together. And if I want to reunify with my child, I've got to work this case plan uh, because we want those kids getting into permanence as soon as possible. So that's a bill that I was very passionate about and very proud to work on and very proud that the governor signed into law. Could you give us a preview of what some of the hot button issues could be for this upcoming session? <clears throat> well, um, well, it's Florida. So what, what is not a hot button issue? <laughs> That's true. Uh, Everything. <laughs> yeah. So I think some of the most controversial issues that you're going to see, I mean, there was a bill uh, filed in the Florida House by Representative Webster Barnaby, modeled after the Texas fetal heartbeat bill. That's a very controversial bill. Um, you know, strong, strident opinions on both sides. And um, I think there's a bill that Representative Fine uh, has filed about uh, putting a stronger ban in place for the teaching of critical race theory. That's going to be a controversial bill with lots of pushback. Um, I think there may be some, some insurance issues, which while not as sexy or glamorous, uh, may be controversial uh, because of the effects it could have on the, on the insurance market. Um, I think even my, my free kill bill is controversial uh, in, in that it pits the trial bar against the chamber. Um, and uh, let's see, what other uh, hot button issues? Um, you know, we've got we've got a budget surplus managing that, um, you know, every every state agency and every nonprofit comes to the legislature and says we don't have enough money. And I think that they're all right. Right. They are. They could all use more money. It's just a finite pie, even with the resources that we have this year and trying to divvy up that pie uh, to give everyone enough to operate and continue to do the work that we want them to do uh, is going to be important. And look, you have um, you have attempts to repeal. Uh, the COVID uh, liability protections that we did last year. You have a bill to repeal uh, HB1, which is our anti-riot, uh, anti-mob bill from last year. So those those issues from last year uh, are still carrying on into this session. So um, those are going to be polarizing. Those are going to be impactful. Those are going to be big fights uh, in both the House and Senate chambers. Uh, and, and along with any any gun legislation that may uh, make its way through, that's, that's the other one is the, um, the constitutional carry and the open carry. Uh, the governor made some comments, I think, uh, two weeks ago or, set, or so that said he would sign a constitutional carry bill if it landed on his desk. Uh, so there, that bill has been filed by, I believe, Representative Sabatini files that bill every year. So um, that would be controversial if that bill moves. So uh, there's no shortage of, of fun and exciting bills to, um, <laughs> to stoke your passions, uh, regardless of whatever side of the aisle you might sit on. That's great. So I'm, we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to just finish up with my favorite question to always ask elected officials, which is, who are some of your political heroes? Are there current or former elected officials that you try to emulate in your public service? Well, Natalie, let me go back to one other very controversial bill that Lawrence McClure has. It's a bill oh. about, uh, I think it's to make strawberry shortcake uh, like the statewide yes. dessert. <laughs> and uh, you know, as, as, a, as a key lime pie guy, I'm gonna. It's gonna be tough for me to vote for that. So we'll see where that. Goes. Um, 
So political heroes, you know, uh, living or dead, or does it matter? Doesn't matter either way. Um, so I, I think when I when I first got elected, you know, I had some great mentors that helped me out. Um, Matt Caldwell, uh, Ray Rodriguez, who really has been like a, a big brother for me in this process. Dane Eagle, who's now, of course, at DEO on the governor's team. Uh, and Senator Benequisto and, uh, and Byron Donalds. And I think in, in watching uh, the way the House operated my first session, there were there were two legislators that I kind of like wanted to be like. And, and those were uh, Ray Rodriguez and, and Byron Donalds. I mean, I, I just, um, you know, if you go back and, and regardless of whether you agree with them on the issue, if you watch the way they conduct themselves in debate, they're collegial, they're professional, they're passionate, and they're always well informed. And that's and that's important uh, when you get up here is to know your bill. Um, you know, the more you learn about it, the more formidable you can be in debate. But uh, watching the way uh, those folks built relationships uh, with their own caucus and across the aisle and, and conducted themselves, I thought was a model of how a legislator uh, should be. And I, I try to emulate those uh, different styles from those two as, as much as I can. Um, so yeah, those, those are two folks uh, that I have had the pleasure of serving with uh, that I think are, are uh, you know, model legislators for anyone looking to come into this process. That's great. Well, thank you, Representative Roach for your time today. And thank you to those of you watching Connect at the, this Connect at the Capitol episode. All right. Thank you, Roach. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. Merry Christmas. Yes. <laughs> Happy holidays. All right. Bye. Mm -hmm.